Enhance 34 to 46. second video in my mini series on super resolution. In this video I'll be reviewing some important background information about the concept as a bit of a soft introduction before jumping into implementation in the near future. As a brief aside, I just want to mention that I've decided to treat this project as more of a case study of a well-known solution to the problem of super resolution. Uh, I, was a bit, I was a bit vague in my project introduction as to whether I was trying to reinvent something that already exists and honestly I didn't really know myself. After more research, I realized that it makes just a lot more sense to try and learn from an existing implementation before trying to magically learn all about super resolution and implement my own model with such little understanding. Silly naive me. I guess. Just one last thing before we get started on the excited stuff. Um, I have linked all the sources that I use for my research in the description, and I encourage you to check them out if you're interested in exploring more on your own. I hate to be the one to crush your dreams, but contrary to popular sci-fi beliefs, you cannot magically regain a perfect image from low quality footage. Information just can't be synthesized from thin air. In information theory, this idea is formally known as the data processing inequality. The idea essentially says that no form of data processing can add information that is not already there to begin with. Intuitively, this makes sense, but it doesn't help my cause. This isn't the end of the road for us though, because we have machine learning on our side. Although the images themselves might not have enough information present to produce a high-res copy, we can utilize the power of neural network models to learn extra context that can help a lot in creating high-res copies down the line. Before we jump right into how to tackle this problem with machine learning techniques though, we should define the problem a bit more formally. In theory, any image has a ground truth high resolution version of itself. Whether it exists physically or just theoretically is a whole other issue. This allows us to, f to define what it means for an image to be low resolution in the first place, which will help us later when we want to define how to undo low resiness. We can define the degradation process of an image as follows. Here, Ix represents a low resolution image and Iy is its theoretical or real high resolution counterpart. The degradation function d represents some process that led to or caused the low resiness to occur with some factor gamma to represent the degree of change caused by d. Essentially, this defines a mapping from high to low resolution, which is usually an unknown process. Conversely, we can define a mapping from low to high resolution as follows. Here, i hat y is the high resolution image recovered from its low resolution counterpart, ix, via a super resolution model f, whose job it is, is to recover the missing information. Theta represents the parameters of the model f, which as we will see later, are the product of using machine learning. Now that we have a more formal description of what super resolution is, there's still one major question to consider. Given what we know from our brief discussion on information theory, we know that we can't usually generate a perfect high resolution result. So how do we know how well we've done? And can we know if what we've generated is the best possible result? This question leads to a common theme discussed in multiple papers that I read through, which is that the problem of super resolution is ill posed by nature. My interpretation of this is that since no perfect reconstruction model F usually exists, there are essentially an infinite number of possible reconstructions, each of which has a different level of quality, or resemblance to the ground truth high resolution image. Our job then, is to do our best to create a model that generates as convincing of a result as possible based on some scoring metric. But how do we quantize the convincingness of an image? It turns out this is really an important question and is honestly a pretty big topic in ongoing research. There's a lot to unpack on this topic alone, so for the sake of time, I'll save some more in-depth exploration for a future video and instead focus on just three metrics. Mean squared error, peak signal to noise ratio, and structural similarity index. In general, I think it's safe to group both mean squared error and peak signal to noise ratio because they're related both mathematically and in their downsides when it comes to measuring relative image quality. 
Mean squared error, in my opinion, is the most intuitive metric and is also very easy to calculate since it is just the mean squared pixel-wise difference between the reconstructed and ground truth image. Peak signal to noise ratio, on the other hand, is a bit less intuitive. It is essentially a scaled ratio of the highest possible pixel value of an image and the mean squared error, which depends on the bit depth and color space of an image. Conversely, to mean squared error, where smaller values indicate better quality, for peak signal to noise ratio, typically higher values are indicative of good quality reconstruction. According to Wikipedia, peak signal to noise ratio, quote unquote, is an approximation to human perception of reconstruction quality. But as I will talk about in just a second, some people don't agree. One major issue with both mean squared error and peak signal to noise ratio is that they do not take the structural components of an image into account which are extremely important for creating reconstructions that appeal to the human eye. This is apparent in the following figure, where each of the surrounding images has the same mean squared error from the target, but clearly some are much better than others in terms of their structural appearance. While both mean squared error and peak signal to noise ratio are still useful metrics of reconstruction quality, super resolution models could greatly benefit from a metric that better mimics human perception. That's where structural similarity index comes in. Structural Similarity Index, or SSIM, is a bit more of a complex metric, but was inspired at least in part by the human vision system, so hopefully the added complexity provides some value. Simply put, SSIM measures quality by comparing various statistical properties of the two input images. I will try my best to explain in a bit more detail, but I highly recommend reading through Paper Source 5 if you're interested in learning more. I also made a small demo of the concepts we're about to talk about, and it's posted on my GitHub. I'll put a link to it down below if you're interested in that as well. Rather than comparing the ground truth and regenerated high resolution images globally, SSIM focuses on smaller regions and patches. Although it's less important for the applications of super resolution, this can provide a map of sorts revealing which regions of the regenerated high resolution image have the highest quality. For each patch, SSIM focuses on three main components in its comparison, luminance, contrast, and structure. Luminance is defined as the average pixel intensity over the given window. Contrast, on the other hand, is defined as the standard deviation of pixel intensities over the given window. And finally, structure. Structure, in my opinion, is less clearly defined, but it is dependent on the covariance between the two windows. In the SSIM algorithm, each of the three statistical components has their own comparison functions, which are defined as follows. The overall SSIM value for a given window is the result of combining the above three functions in the following manner. While the resulting quality metric is only for a local region of the input images, it's easy to define a more global measure of quality by simply averaging the SSIM values for each possible window. Despite its complicated and, in my opinion, unintuitive definition, SSIM can provide a more meaningful metric of comparative quality because it takes into account structural features which again, mean squared error and peak signal to noise ratio do not. Mean squared error, peak signal to noise ratio, and SSIM are examples of quality metrics that assume a ground truth high resolution image is available to compare to. This is why they are classified as full reference quality metrics. Other methods can be used in full or partial absence of a high resolution comparison, but I won't cover them here because we're focused on a model in which we do have a reference. It's also important to mention that the exact math of these depends on the color space being used for a particular image. The methods overall are consistent, but calculations will differ slightly for images in the RGB color space versus grayscale, or if different bit depths are used, for example. That was a lot of stuff, so let's take a quick step back and see what we've done. We started by defining the problem of super resolution to be creating a model F to map a low resolution input to a high resolution regeneration, which attempts to undo the effects of the degradation function D. We then showed the limitations we face due to information theory and the data processing inequality, resulting in the ill-posed nature of super resolution and the question of how we measure our regeneration quality. Finally, we partially answered this question by discussing various metrics of objective image quality, such as mean squared error, peak signal to noise ratio, and SSIM. With a better understanding of the problem, we can now turn our attention to the main question remaining. How do we create a function f to map from low to high resolution images? And it turns out, like most problems in computer vision, it's machine learning, specifically convolutional neural networks, to the rescue. Since there are already so many great videos and resources on convolutional neural networks, or CNNs, I won't try to reinvent the wheel and provide a more comprehensive overview. 
However, I'll try to provide some intuition as to what they do so it's clear why such a model is well suited for super resolution. Essentially, CNNs are a type of model that is particularly useful for data in the form of images, compared to others from machine learning models like classic neural networks, regression models, etc., which require features to be predetermined, CNNs are amazing in that they learn relevant features during training. This is all possible because of the convolution layers that distinguish CNNs from other forms of neural networks. When an image is passed through a convolution layer, it is convolved with a series of filters to produce a set of images, usually downsized by the filters. The number and size of these filters are parameters that we can change depending on the problem at hand. I'll be talking a little bit more about this in the next video during the implementation process, but for now let's just focus on the concept. During training, the values of the filters and also the biases that are associated with each filter are learned. Remember theta from our previous discussion? That's this. In the case of SRCNN, or the model that we're talking about in this video, this is done via stochastic gradient descent. Conceptually, the learned filters will detect specific patterns in the input image and use that information to help provide more context about the input down through the other layers of the network. Now, it took me a while to fully wrap my brain around this, but luckily one of my professors mentioned a tool in class that he and some of his colleagues developed to help visualize what the filters in CNNs are actually learning to detect. Here's some footage from their work that I think might help us better understand what is going on. We developed this interactive deep visualization toolbox to shine light into these black boxes, showing what happens inside of neural nets. In the top left corner, we show the input to the network, which can be a still image or video from a webcam. These black squares in the middle show the activations on a single layer of a network, in this case the popular deep neural network called AlexNet running in CAFE. By interacting with the network, we can see what some of the neurons are doing. For example, on this first layer, a unit in the center responds strongly to light to dark edges. Its neighbor, one neuron over, responds to edges in the opposite direction, dark to light. Using optimization, we can synthetically produce images that light up each neuron on this layer to see what each neuron is looking for. So as you can see, this is actually quite amazing. The filters are learning to detect things like edges, words, wrinkles, and even faces. If this isn't proof enough to show you the power of CNNs, then honestly, I don't know what is. Okay, that was a lot of rambling, but in summary, CNNs are a great model for the problem of super resolution because of their ability to learn complex features and relationships in images. One question you might be asking is, okay, so CNNs seem to be able to find features in images, but how are we going to use those features to map from low to high resolution images? I'll attempt to answer this question in the next section. I'm going to digress quickly to talk about a topic called sparse coding, which might provide a little bit more intuition about what the learning process is doing. You can skip ahead if you just want to see the CNN explanation, but I found reading about sparse coding to help me understand the CNN approach a little bit better. Also, sparse coding is another common approach to super resolution, and a quick explanation would help anyone viewing this video who also wants to read the paper. Essentially, sparse coding is a method of breaking down data, images in our case, into a set of primitive or low-level components and then figuring out what combination of those level level elements can recreate the original data, either perfectly or to the best of our ability. If you've ever heard of PCA or principal component analysis, this is similar in that it reduces the data into a set of more atomic elements. The main difference between PCA and sparse coding is that sparse coding results in a more overcomplete set of low level elements, whereas PCA is only complete. By overcomplete, I just mean that, you know, the set of subcomponents is redundant or non-minimal which provides a little more leeway when it comes to reconstructing data using the set. If you'd like a more mathy description of sparse coding, I'd highly recommend reading through the short article I linked in the description. I wish I had a more descriptive and intuitive answer to the question of exactly how the network is learning to map from low to high resolution images. However, the best I can do is to combine what I've learned about sparse coding and CNNs in general to provide a vague and incomplete description that is honestly written everywhere, which is, you know, Early layers learn primitive features like edges, whereas deeper layers learn complex relationships between features and basically perform transformations on them until, you know, you perform a reconstruction at the end. So very vague and, you know, open-ended. I guess, you know, what I'm trying to say is I don't really know what I'm saying. And funnily enough, I think that's actually okay. Let me explain. When it comes to machine learning, understanding what a network is really doing can be very difficult, if not impossible, in certain situations. I say this because our brains can really only understand things up to three dimensions. The patterns and processes that machine learning algorithms can learn can be in much higher dimensions, making it very difficult for us to fully understand what's really going on. This is why I say it's okay that I don't know what I'm talking about. 
Now, I can't just blatantly say it's fine that I don't know what I'm talking about because I'm making a video about something that I claim to know a little bit about. But what I'm trying to say is, you know, I'm no expert on convolutional neural networks, but at the end of the day, I honestly don't know if it's possible for anyone to fully understand what's going on. So that's why I'm saying with what little position I have to be saying this, that, you know, I think it's slightly okay that I don't know what I'm talking about. I like to think about it like this. You wouldn't usually hire someone to do a job you know how to do. You hire them because they do something that you can't. In my eyes, I'm hiring a CNN to learn how to map low resolution to high resolution images. If I knew how to write the mapping function, I would, but since the mapping is so complex, having a network learn for me is just much more feasible. Now, I'll combine what we know about CNNs and the super resolution problem definition to lay out a high level plan for designing our network. This discussion will guide our implementation in the next video. Conceptually, SRCNN can be broken down into three separate steps. Patch extraction, nonlinear mapping, and reconstruction. During patch extraction, the input image is convolved with a series of filters in a convolution layer like we talked about earlier. Each of these extracts an n-one-dimensional feature from the patch of the image where they were calculated over. This operation produces what are known as feature maps for the input image. Essentially, these feature maps contain a condensed representation of the image where each entry is a high-dimensional feature from the corresponding image patch. The feature maps are then passed through ReLU, which is a common activation function. Formally, this is summarized by the following equation. The nonlinear mapping phase converts the n1 dimensional features we found previously to n2 dimensional ones. This is more difficult to understand conceptually, but it's safe to say that the features produced in this phase are n2 dimensional representations of high res patches of the input image. The mapping process is defined by the following equation. And finally, reconstruction. Now, depending on the dimensions of the nonlinearly mapped extracted features, uh, the reconstruction filters can be interpreted in two main ways. If the features are already in the image domain, they are interpreted as an averaging filter which merge the high resolution patches to form the final result. But if the features are not already in the image space, the filters are interpreted as projecting and averaging filters which first bring the features back into the image domain and then merge them to form the high resolution result. The following equation represents this process more formally. So it looks like our final network will comprise three convolution layers, one for each of the steps we discussed. That's a lot to digest. From first introducing a formal definition for super resolution to describing the steps a model would take to solve it, we've covered a lot of information. If anything is still unclear, I highly encourage you to supplement this video by reading through the papers and even checking the other sources I listed if you have time. And always, you know, feel free to ask questions you have in the comments and I'll do my best either to answer them or guide you in the direction of an answer. Now that we have more knowledge of the problem, all that's left is to implement a solution. And that's exactly what we'll be doing in the next video or few videos. Again, thank you for tuning in to this episode of the Super Resolution series. I hope you learned something and I hope you enjoyed it. See you soon.